Hi there, everyone. We're going to be talking about the prokaryotic cell walls in this video. So cell walls help to maintain um, the shape of the cell. And um, oftentimes they have special substances found within those cell walls that actually helps to um, identify the different organisms. So many organisms have cell walls, um, both in the prokaryotic world as well as in the eukaryotic world. Um, animals do not, protozoans do not, but most of the other organisms do. So um, the archaeans have a substance in their cell wall known as pseudomurine or pseudopeptidoglycan, whereas in bacteria, they have a substance called peptidoglycan. And this allows us to separate archaea from bacteria. This is one mechanism. Um, no other organisms have pseudopeptidoglycan and no other organisms have peptidoglycan. This peptidoglycan um, also allows us to separate organisms into two major groups of bacteria, gram-negative and gram-positive, because the, the amount of peptidoglycan differs between the two. And so this is just an image of gram-positive and gram-negative um, bacteria with their peptidoglycan. So when you look at the plasma membrane of the bacteria, here you have the plasma membrane of a gram-positive cell. Here's the plasma membrane of a gram-negative cell. So this is the cytoplasm of the cell inside. Out here would be the extracellular environment. And so this is the cell wall here. And so this is the cell wall here. The cell wall of gram-positives and gram-negatives is very different. If you look, there are multiple layers of peptidoglycan. There are up to 30 layers of peptidoglycan in gram-positive bacteria. But in gram-negative, there's only one or two layers of peptidoglycan. Gram-negative bacteria have a second plasma membrane. So this is the inner membrane, which is just like this cell membrane. But then they have an outer membrane. And in the outer membrane, they have these special um, proteins and lipids that stick out that, that allow us to identify gram-negative bacteria into different groupings, okay? So peptidoglycan is really important to many of our gram or many of our bacteria because it's part of that cell wall. And so if you are, if, if you inhibit peptidoglycan synthesis, this can cause cells to become very sensitive to osmotic pressures. So think about it. Um, I was showing you the picture of osmosis with the cell wall and fluids moving in, and it causes that turgor pressure or not turgor pressure, it causes um, the cell to start to swell, but the cell wall helps to maintain and keeps them from lysis, lysing opened. If you inhibit peptidoglycan synthesis, now that cell wall is not very strong, and if fluids move in, that cell can burst. And so it actually causes um, cells to not be able to survive in different osmotic environments. This is going to be much more effective against gram-positive bacteria. Uh, the reason for this is gram-positive bacteria have multiple layers of peptidoglycan. That's what their cell wall is composed of. Whereas gram-negative bacteria only have like one or two layers, but they have that extra cell membrane. So if the peptidoglycan are wiped out, they still have a protective membrane as part of their cell wall. So it does um, tend to affect gram positives much more than gram negatives. And so here is, hold on, 
I love this. I found this a couple of years ago and I've kept it because I just love it. This is the bold and the bacterial instead of bold and the beautiful. And here's a gram positive cell talking to his parents or her parents, whatever. I don't care if he is penicillin. We are in love. So those two are in love and penicillin will kill. So, but super cute, right? Anyways. So let's look at gram-negative bacterial cells. They're a little bit more complex. Since they don't have all those peptidoglycan layers, gram-negatives have an outer membrane. And associated with the outer membrane, they have these structures called lipopolysaccharides. A lipopolysaccharide is a lipid with a carbohydrate group attached to it. So they have this O antigen, which is the polysaccharide portion, and then they have this lipid known as lipid A, okay? The O antigen actually specifies different strains of bacteria. So um, I'm not sure, I don't think I've said it to you, but I, most of you probably know that E. coli live in our gut, and if you didn't know, now you know that we have E. coli in our gut. E. coli actually live in our gut and they keep us healthy. They actually help to produce certain vitamins. Um, so if they were gone, we would be very ill. But you've also, I'm sure, heard of E. coli poisoning. If you eat food that hasn't been cooked properly, um, you can get E. coli poisoning. Well, the E. coli that's in our gut differs from the E. coli that causes gastroenteritis. These are different strains. So this O antigen actually refers to a specific side chain um, that um, separates organisms. So we know that E. coli O157H7 is a pathogenic strain of E. coli, whereas the E. coli that live in our gut are not pathogenic. So they don't cause disease. So this is very helpful in us being able to identify the type of organism. And then we have this lipid A, which is an endotoxin. So lipid A is um, attached to the plasma membrane or is um, a portion of that ex external plasma membrane. And when we damage that plasma membrane, when we kill the cell, then that, that lipid A is released into the system. And when it gets released, it can cause Fever. So what it what it does, lipid A is, is a pyrogen, P-Y-R-O-G-E-N. Pyrogens um, cause an increase in temperature. So when they get released, they go to, in humans, they go to the hypothalamus and they cause our temperature center in the hypothalamus to reset at a higher temperature. So the more lipid A we release, the higher our temperature can go. And this can actually lead to endotoxic shock, which is very dangerous. So back, gram negative bacteria are oftentimes harder to control when you have a gram negative infection because of the side effects of killing off the cells. Surrounding the bacterial cell wall is a structure known as a glycocalyx. So this is like a sugar coat that surrounds the cell. And it basically functions in protection for the cell as well as allowing the cells to form biofilms. Uh, the glycocalyx can be organized into a nice um, structure known as a capsule. And sometimes it is not as organized, and then it is called a slime layer. But in both cases, um, the glycocalyx will protect the bacterial cell from the host's immune system, and it can help 
the cell to adhere to certain surfaces, forming a biofilm or in the formation of biofilm. Fimbriae and pili um, are structures that aid in um, attachment to surfaces. So fimbriae are shorter, but there's more of them. There's um, bacteria can have lots of fimbriae. When the fimbriae is long, it is known as a pili. So they're the same thing, but the very long fimbriae are known as pili. And um, one specific type of pili that some cells have is known as a sex pilus. A sex pilus allows bacteria to attach to one another and then share genetic information, which we'll talk about when we get into the genetics portion. And then bacteria um, sometimes also have flagella. Flagella are structures that allow the cells to move. So not all bacterial cells are able to move, but those that are able to move often use flagella. And so flagella just um, can be found in different areas of, of the cell, and they help the cell to move in different um, activities. So when flagella move in bacteria, it looks very different than when flagella move in eukaryotic organisms. They move in a series of runs and tumbles. So they move towards or away from some chemical stimulant. So if it's an attractant, they're going towards it. If it's a, a detractant, so something that is um, potentially harmful, they're going to move away from it. But they don't move in a straight line like you would see in eukaryotic cells. They move in a run, they go very, very fast towards or away from the chemical, and then they tumble, and eventually they get to where they want to go. So I told you that you could have flagella in different areas. We have monotrics monotrichous flagella, which have one single flagellum at the end of a cell. Amphitrichous are going to have one single flagellum at each end of the cell. If you have a lophotrichous um, flagella, then you have a tuft of flagella on one side of the cell. And then um, peritrichous flagella cover the entire cell surface. So they're all around. E. coli, one of my favorites, um, actually has peritrichous flagella. So they're covered in flagella. It's like hair everywhere. They're really adorable if you see them under a microscope um, or if not under a microscope. If you see them under a, after doing a flagella stain, then you'll see the, all those flagella standing out. All right, I'm going to stop this video. And we'll get in our last video. We'll talk about eukaryotic structures, okay? Bye.